and welcome to the weekly MG EV podcast, streaming live on Monday, 24th of May, 2021. As you know, we're normally here to talk about MG electrical, electric vehicles, the MG ZS, the MG5 and the MG HS, and we're hoping to inform and entertain you for in the next hour or so. But tonight, we're going to focus almost entirely on the MG5. I'm Dave Stewart, username Dave S on the forum, and joining me on tonight's episode are MG owners uh, from Wigan, Les Burrows. Hi, everyone. Les Burrows on the forum. Imaginative Les, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, from Oxfordshire, Matthew Todd. Hi, I'm Fudge from the um, forum. Uh, from Southampton, uh, Stuart Whitman. Hi, um, Stu Whit 46 on the forum. And as ever, it's great to see from North Yorkshire, the Innovations and Development Manager at the Charlie Group, Miles Roberts. Miles per kilowatt hour on the forum. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, it's great to be joined by two new faces, well, I say new, <laughs> new to us anyway. Uh, Matt and Les, you're very welcome. Matt, you're you're from Wigan. What, 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 how long have you been driving EVs? Oh, sorry, Les, you're from Wigan. Yeah. yeah, I'm from Wigan, yeah. yeah. Um, I've had my car now for uh, six weeks, I think. All six weeks I've had the MG5. Right, and you liking it? I like it very much, yeah, I like it very much. Um, I've had no problems with it whatsoever. I've been really? quite impressed with what it can do. Great. Um, there's certain things about it I don't like, but at the end of the day, nothing's perfect in life, so you just got to make the best you can, but... It's uh, it's very good, very good for what it is and for what it costs. Good, and Matt, you're somewhere from Oxfordshire? Yep. And you've been driving EVs for how long? I've had mine for about three weeks. Before that, I had a um, diesel van for about three years. Right, okay, okay. Yeah, I think quite a few of us have come over from diesel to, to electric, so uh, that's good. So, great, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and everybody, if you're watching live, thank you for joining us. And please click, uh, click the like button and say hello in the chat window. I don't have my normal wingman uh, looking at the chat, so Stuart and I will try and pick up as much on the chat as possible. If you're watching later, thank you for choosing to watch this video. And please subscribe, get a notification for the next time we go live. So as I alluded to right at the start, this podcast is mainly about the MG5. What are you enjoying most about it? Is it the range? Is it the comfort? Is it the equipment? Is it the versatility? Does it just suit you? That, yeah. So, and and yeah, it's an interesting point you raised, Les. There's some things you don't like. One of the things we often say in the podcast is there will be things we don't like our car about our car. But what we are trying to do is just share our opinions with everybody. Uh, and please, you know, if we are coming over negative about something, it's because something has arced us, but we want to chat about it. So uh, who'd want to kick off? What, what was the thing that attracted you to the MG5? The thing that attracted what? me to the MG5 was the fact that it was uh, an EV, which I've been wanting for a while because my son drives EVs. And uh, the price was right. And I got a good deal because of the uh, offers that MG had on at the time. I couldn't really turn it away. I mean, up until the problem with the roof rails, I'd have had it months prior. But because of the problem with the roof rails, I had it on hold for about four months, maybe five months. And I wouldn't take delivery of it until something was um, sorted out about the, the roof rails, which we thought had been, but now I don't know. We'll see. So we're, am I right in thinking the list price for the MG5 is somewhere about the 26 grand? So I'm looking at miles probably here. Yeah, so the list price is about a thousand pounds cheaper than the equivalent ZS EV. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the pricing is, I mean, there's been various offers on around uh, swappage deals and things like that that we've run in the past. Um, but yeah, the, the list price starts at around 26. Uh, it's twenty-eight thousand pounds now for the government grant. There's usually some deals to be had. On top of that, I think we can currently we could do you a deal if anyone out there wants an MG5 exclusive. Uh, we've got several in stock, and we could do them for about twenty-three and a half, twenty-four thousand pounds. Um, so uh, we've. Uh, well, good news. 
Well, it's, it's, it's good news for us. We've got some, we've got some cars we can sell them. You know, it's uh, not all of our um, brands that we currently sell have got a stock of cars. Um, so MG has been quite good for us in that respect, and that we've actually had cars we can sell. Um, I first drove the MG5 in a pre-production version. It was, when I say pre-production, I mean it was a um, a car that had a 3D printed dashboard um, to convert from left-hand drive to right-hand drive. Um, it was really not the finished product at all, but it was, I drove that and I drove a left-hand drive Chinese one. Um, so I drove the Rowe EI5 with its 100 horsepower motor. Um, and then I drove the MG5 that we ended up with, with the 150 power, uh, horsepower motor. Um, and uh, the two drove very, very differently. And the, the suspension changes they made between the two cars was quite dramatic as well. So the Chinese MG5 was quite softly sprung, similar to the ZS, if not a bit softer, uh, a bit wallowy around corners and things. And they've really firmed things up on the, on the UK version uh, for European market, which is welcome. Um, and at the time, actually, when we had the discussion uh, about the car and bringing it to market, uh, there were a couple of things that we were discussing as to spec levels and things like that. Um, in China, sometimes they do interesting trim choices, like we'll have like a, a white leather interior or something like that, which whilst it might look okay on photo, it's not particularly practical and certainly not for our sort of core fleet at stroke taxi market that we were targeting with the MG5. Um, and the car had a, an option of having a, a small cassette type um, sunroof. And that was actually deleted from the spec for UK because it added quite a bit to the cost price. And because the position where it sat in the car, it was, it was actually starting behind your head, but it was only about that, that deep. So it was, like, it was like 30 centimeters back, but it started behind your head. So it didn't give you any lighter ahead of you didn't really give you any benefit in terms of ventilation. Of course, the car's got climate control anyway. So we ended up deleting that from the spec. Um, some people have since criticized that saying that, you know, they've seen the, the Roe has the sunroof and why don't we have it in the UK? But I think for us, it was a case of, well, it adds a lot of cost. It doesn't add a lot of function. It's something that potentially can go wrong and leak in the future, you know, down the years. Um, and it's not like, if it was the big glass roof like you've got in the ZS, then obviously, you know, that's that a pretty good selling point. But in terms of the um, the cassette one, we just thought it wasn't really worth it for the amount of cost it would add. Um, but uh, MG themselves um, have had a couple of issues with the Z with the MG5 launch in the UK in terms of obviously the, um, the roof load capacity, which it turns out they didn't have the right certification for UK for UK and Europe sales. And so they had to submit that when they realized, but they didn't realize until after the car had already been given a release date in the UK. So uh, that's why there was the initial confusion and, um, you know, the, the things in the, in the handbook saying the decorative use only. Um, and that was a, it was, uh, Shocked to me because I didn't, when I drove the original prototype from MG, I had it for a week from MG to do some filming with and things. And I actually used it, I put a roof rack and roof bars and well, actually a, a roof box on. And me and my family went away for the weekend to Whitby with all of our bags up in the roof. So um, when it said they were decorative only, I was like, well, to be fair, nothing fell off it. You know, it all, it, it, it actually, it seemed to go on the roof and be quieter than it was in my MG, in, in my wife's ZSEV. Um, so we, we were actually quite happy with how it carried that load. Um, yeah. So uh, I was quite surprised when they said it, it wasn't uh, tested. But it has now been tested. Uh, just to give an update to everyone, Les, it's thanks to your efforts on this with the DVSA and with everyone else that you've been involved with. But um, there's going to be a recall where basically they call the cars back into the workshop. Um, all they're doing, though, is they're just... Uh, printing out and sticking a addendum page into the workshop manual um, that says that the car is um, now, can now be used for load bearing purposes up to a maximum of 35 kilos. Um, it's been tested to uh, ECE and international standards such as ISO 11154, um, not to be confused with ISO 11155, of course, that would be crazy. 
Um, testing included crash testing, static loads in multiple directions, um, far in excess of loads you'd normally see in normal driving conditions, very rough, rough road durability, etc. So they've gone through the full testing procedure with it, but that's why it's taken a while because it was an outside agency doing the testing. Um, the 35 kilos weight includes the combined weight of roof bars, items carried and accessories such as roof boxes, etc. Um, and they obviously they recommend MG approved accessories are used to fit to the roof rails. Um, but there are some aftermarket bars which do fit. Um, and I myself have a set of very cheap um, roof bars that I got from uh, a discount supermarket for about 30 quid. And although they whistle like a kettle when you get above 40 miles an hour, um, they do the job for, you know, little runs to the tip and things like that. So, um, so yeah, the roof bars situation is now finally closed. Yeah. And are MG supplying divan bases for everybody to carry around on the roof bars? Uh, so, um, yeah, no, that was me helping my mate uh, clear, his, uh, clear his house out, um, his... Uh, moving out and so yeah he had a various stuff and he's like i turned up originally he said there was five bin bags to carry and we ended up doing three runs to the tip and one of them was yeah taking a double divan bed base uh to the tip um but uh, i put one inside easily enough and then the other one we put on the roof and then we stacked all the stuff around it so um yeah works the roof bars work um I'm sure people look at that photo of the divan base and say, God, I hope you weren't going far in that. That was just bungee strapped on. That's not very safe, but. I, um, I for one, am going to miss the roof bar chat. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's, up there, it's up there with BMS as one of my uh, most hated topics. Uh, it was getting there, wasn't it? It was getting there with the old BMS chat, wasn't it? It was like, really? Let's just put an end to it. Either yeah. take them off. Sure, you've said before you like the MG5 because you've got about 500 dogs or something like yeah. that, haven't you? I've got four dogs. Oh, uh, right, okay. Yeah, but yeah, uh, just like talking, uh, obviously talking about the car itself, the, the whole, one of the reasons why I went for the, um, the, the five estate was because it was the only estate electric car on sale in the UK at the time. Um, and I carry stuff around for work. And I travel a fair bit as well. And I need that lowish, um loading space if you like for the dogs i've got different shaped dogs i've got german shepherd a whippet and two sausage dogs and um to start with i was really concerned about how small i felt the space was but i came from an e-class merc which is um you know cavernous anyway you know i could fit i even had a doberman in the back of that one so it was very much the the if you like the decision making thing for me was whether i could get the dogs in the car um, and I even, when I bought the car and took delivery of it, I put the two bigger dogs in the boot and then the two tiny little dogs went on like a back seat cover. And then I realised, actually, I do have more space. So they go in a, a dog crate, the little ones do, and the other two just stand alongside. There's plenty of room, plenty of height. Um, and they all jump in apart from the sausages. Obviously, they don't jump in. But um, no, so that was one kind of, thing that was holding me back from making my decision um and actually i had no sort of worry about it at all and um they fit you know they fit well um and I, I must admit i'm really impressed with the luggage space i didn't even when i remember looking at the car originally i didn't realize it was as big as it actually is i think it's quite surprising especially with the seats down even though they don't go flat um i've had the seats down a fair few times tip runs etc i'd say my when we're looking if we're starting at the back of the car my only kind of complaint is the lack of quality of the fabric that is on the rear of the seats i've had my car now for just turned over eight thousand miles and that fabric's not going to last long it's really cheap not very kind of um it's not what i'm expecting more expect not i wasn't expecting mercedes standard but i wasn't expecting the the thinness, Les, you're nodding. You've obviously got that as well. Yeah, I've got the same thing. Yeah, same with the floor. And if you haven't got protection back in, the, the rubber, the rubberized, I should yeah. say, mat, which yeah, is yeah. also very, very thin. Yeah, uh, yeah it is. It is. Uh, it's not the best quality of things. Definitely not. I can see that not lasting very long in like years to come. 
and it's kind of just stitched on. It's just like fabric on the back of a seat, yeah. isn't it? Mm. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. Really, it's quite a thin carpet, isn't it? It's quite a thin sort of texturized, yeah. a bit like what uh, what they used to fit into subwoofer enclosures that they sold in Halfords for about forty quid back in the day. You know, yeah. those sort of the entry level subwoofer sort of carpet, that sort of. But that's it's it's, it's really quite. Because there's quite a few people are looking at some sort of boot liners, which fits the whole of the boot, the back seat, the sides, the bottom. Yeah, I believe the sells them on AliExpress. Well, not actually come up with anything yet. I don't think anybody's found anything that fits perfectly yet. There is one or two floating about, but I don't think they quite fit. I know somebody, I can't remember just who it was, I think it was somebody um, uh, on, the, on the forum the other day, somebody's found one that fits perfectly, the ZS. Yes. And somebody's emailed the company to ask if they done one for the MG5 and not as yet. So I'm waiting for the response. Look for that. I'll, I'll probably buy one. There's a company called Hatchbag um, that I had. Yeah, that's from, right, yeah. I had that for my Merc, and I emailed them just before I got the the MG to see, and they said they had such a backlog um, because of the year. Yeah, already, we, already both. The year we don't talk about. Um, so hopefully they'll get around. If there's more sales. And hopefully, um, you know, there'll be a demand for because they they just bespoke make them. They even with the Merc, if you've got different types of fix fixings and fittings in the you know the the load holders etc. Absolutely superb, really durable and well recommended. Um, that's what I'm waiting for anyway. Stuart G Cam is just Stuart G Cam is just out numbered. You you've he's yeah. got six dogs. I saw that. Yeah. Be interesting to see what they are, but well done. Yeah, the lip he mentions the lip as well. He or she, sorry, G Cam, but um, G Cam, yeah, sorry. Um, the lip is a bit of an issue, but I think that's down to the structure, isn't it? And the strengthening that it has to be kind of quite high to give you a bit of protection, I guess, at the back. Matt, haven't had a chance to ask you yet. What was it attracted you to the MG5? Oh, I had a look at a few different ones, I was looking at the um, I owned a Kona originally and the Ionic um, and I did a bit of reading up the MGs like kept coming up with okay reviews and all the proper review places this that and the other and for the price what well, I had a look at it and had a good test drive on it and for the price I really could not say no to it I really couldn't Did you find you were selling it to other people but didn't convince yourself? That's what I was doing. Well, as soon as I'd driven it and actually been in one properly, for the money, I really can't not. It's not even like trying to sell it with people. I could not say no to it. No. It was one of those, it was five grand less than the cone I was looking at for the just the standard price without getting any deals or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, what extra do I get which I could use? apart from it's higher and this and the other, going to London, which I do occasionally, there's a lot of very small, low car parks I've been in. Mm. And I know a big car gets um, very um, scary going into them. Especially with a divan base on the, the, the roof bars. No? <laughs> so you're all speaking very highly of it. Uh, you have mentioned the, the backing lining for the, the, the back seat. Uh, in the boot. Anything else that's arcing you, displeasing you? I mean, that's well, the not being able to fall properly is yeah, uh, yeah. a bit of a letdown, really, because it, you know, I don't know when you say cars that don't fall down flat. It's crazy. I mean, somebody on the forum has actually lifted the back seat out, but I have tried a couple of times to get mine. It's absolutely solid. I can't get it out. I've had a go myself, and it does come out quite easily if you work out where the catches are. With it out, it does fold flat quite nicely. Yeah, um, I believe it will fall flat when you've done that. Yeah, but I mean, how, how do you get the, the base out? How do you get the seat swab out? Um, you stand each side, there's a catch probably about six inches in each side, and it's just a little spring loaded catch. You just pull it up vertically straight up. From the front? At the bottom of it, you just pull straight up and it goes pop and just comes out. And then once the two catches are popped out, you slide it forward towards the front seats. Oh, okay. That's not right. I'll be, I'll be trying to pull it from. Well, the back, the back rest, I've been trying to put me out. Uh, it's still it's forward. It's, it won't come. four inches from the front of the seat where the catch is in, about six inches in. No. There's a catch one each side, and that's it. The back which slides under the back of it. 
and easy enough to replace, Matt, when you... Yeah, the only thing I found was annoying was getting the seatbelts through the holes. All oh, right, yeah. Yeah, that, I've, I've after that as well. I mean, I, um, I've... Or one of them, the easy answer for the passenger side I found was if you clip the middle seatbelt in the passenger side clip, that holds it nice and tight straight up. Yeah. It's just the fact of getting the other two through. Yeah, I did the same thing. Oh, God. Mm. I went to pick up a new computer desk from um, Sheffield and uh, it, I was like, it wouldn't fit that way. It wouldn't fit because of the long legs on it and the relatively short, it was like, it's quite a square table. Mm. And so the length of legs meant that uh, it, the only way it would fit, it wouldn't fit in with the legs pointing, with the flat, with the legs pointing upwards because then you couldn't get it round the hatch. It wouldn't fit with it the other way up because of the same reason. So you had to put it sideways when you put it sideways again you couldn't quite put it down enough to get it over the um the inclined seat base the inclined seat base made, meant it touched the roof so i had to so i had to quickly pull the seat base out and then the seats um so the seat back um it's got like a, a thing that holds it in at the side uh, it's sort of like a, a square peg that sort of slides down into a holder and so you can sort of slide that up and then that allows you to sort of take the, the rear, um, the back rest itself out. Um, but then they're all attached to, to the seat belts and everything again. So you're just not really helping yourself much. You're not, you can't take it all the way out without using spanners and things. Um, but yeah, I, anyway, I found out once taking the seat belts it based off it, it fit anyway after that. But. The other thing I did notice about taking the seat base out is it does expose the pretension of wiring. Yes. Which obviously um, you have to be very careful of because they are explosive. Yeah. I know it's early days yet, guys. And Stuart said in the past that he's really quite pleased with the range. How are you guys finding it being new to the, the five? I took a trip to Kent over the weekend and I did 300 miles in total. Uh, charged it up once for a long charge and I did a quick 15 minute charge just before I drove back this way. It was fine. Sorry, I missed you. How many miles was that, Matt? 100 miles in total it was over the weekend. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. Liz? Um, I did just over 500 miles last week, um, down to Buckinghamshire through uh, relations. And uh, I left here fully charged. And going down, it was a terrible day. It was blowing a gale, raining. Everything was going on. And we had the heating on because it was very cold and damp the air conditioning on to keep the windows clear and uh, I got down as far as Warwick services and when I got there was an e ecotricity charger which was working but it was in use um, and the guy was going to be another half an hour so I thought well I ain't hanging about so I carried on down to a brand new one at Banbury which was on the M40 and they've got eight ecotricity uh, instabolt ones there and absolutely brilliant first class couldn't, couldn't fault it at all brilliant so I just put ten pounds worth of uh, electricity in there. I can't remember how many kilowatts it was. It wasn't a lot, but about thirty-five or something like that. I think it's thirty-five pence a kilowatt. I put ten pounds worth of fuel in there. I got down to Buckinghamshire without any problems, and then I charged it on the granny charger before I came home, and I stopped off just for a nosy at the grid serve one at uh, Rugby on the M1, M1 M6 interchange. There's a brand new one, the rugby, which you probably all know about. Um, absolutely superb. The only drawback with that basically is the services for toilets, uh, food, etc., coffee, etc. It's quite a walk away from the actual charges. So I have put a thing on the thing saying if you're going to get there and you've got some of these trouble walking, drop them off first before you go and pack up. Um, but that again was brilliant. And I put another six pound i think in there so it cost me about what 15 pounds 16 pounds to go to buckinghamshire about which is about 500 miles at hamilton so brilliant i'm brilliant. i'm averaging 4.3 4.3 4.3 4 miles per kilowatt hour in it wow brilliant really good. good i'm not at the, at the moment it's got about 1560 miles on it i think at the moment i looked this afternoon and for that 1560 miles it's averaged 4.2 kilowatts brilliant Mm. Yeah, I thought I did well this weekend. I, I, I drove um, sort of up through the dales and things and around this weekend. And I, did a hundred, I did 110 miles at 50%. Um, mm -hmm. 
so I thought that was pretty good going. Uh, yeah. The um, I, I lent uh, my car out to a, uh, a business last week who um, were testing it to see about using it as a, a long distance business vehicle. And um, it's worked very well for them, very well. I mean, to give you an idea, um, I gave them the vehicle with 300 miles on it and it had 2000 miles on when I got it back. So I oh. um, hope my... Uh, Sales manager isn't watching this video because he won't be keen on that. But <laughs> it's um, you know they've done it, yes, well over a thousand miles in a week. Um, every day was two three hundred miles, um, and it, it just it ate at the miles for them. And they said you know realistically they were getting um, over two hundred miles to a charge, despite like Les said it was really crappy weather last week. Um, yeah, sure. And uh, you know they were still getting sort of you know three point eight three point nine four miles per kilowatt hour um so they were they were very happy with that in terms of range and really in terms of that sort of range that you get um there's not many cars well there's not any under 30 grand i can't think of that would get oh, that sort of mile mileage um the zoe but the zoe is a much smaller car mm -hmm. um so i think that really you know i think that the that's one thing that the mg5 is in a, a class of its own really in terms of the range that you get and the, the price you pay yes you can get a similar sort of range or maybe slightly better if you spend north of well north of thirty thousand pounds on something like a kona and a or a um nero or obviously model threes and things like you know teslas um but in terms of you know the price point you know sub 30 and, and often quite a bit below 30 um grand i think that it takes some beating, really. It's unbeatable. It is unbeatable, all this. I mean, it did shock me the fact that it was the first long trip I've done. I've only done running around my own area and up until then. And then we decided to go down there, and that was a 500 mile journey to town pitch. And I must admit, going down, I was watching it, and it was down to, at one stage, 3.6. And I just put it down to the fact of the weather, the heater, the wipers, the lights, everything on, and I knew it was burning fuel. But even when I got down to Bambi, which was about 128 miles from me, uh, I still had um, about 28% left on the battery, even at that stage. I would not have made it all the way, but I didn't take the risk of going any further in case any of the other chargers weren't working or was in use. I knew there was this Instavolt thing with eight chargers, and I thought, I'm bound to get on one of them. So I pulled in there, and it was across the coffee place, and there was eight charges there. Everyone was in use. But just as I pulled in, there was a guy pulling out. So I just slotted it in there and went and got a coffee. Really? No problem at all. Coming back, that grid serve on the M6 Junction 1 uh, is absolutely superb. That is absolutely what, what we're going for. In fact, I think today I put something on the uh, Franklin Energy, I think it's called. They're going to put 236 charges in at Brent Cross shopping centre in North London, 236, that is colossal. I mean, it's going in the right direction, you don't get it behind. Well, there's just been an announcement today as well about 300 million pounds of uh, government spending to go towards uh, rapid charger infrastructure on the motorways. They said they can put another 2,000 rapid chargers out there. Very good. Um, so it is, it's all very much needed. I had this conversation on, on one of the Facebook groups earlier, um, someone who said that they were they were irked that they got to a rapid charge and someone was on there till 92% and, you know, she had to wait. And I was like, it's not really the fault of the driver. The driver might well, if the driver's in an old Nissan Leaf that only does 60 miles to a charge, they probably need every one of those percentage points to get where they're going. They don't knock off at 80, you know, and it's a fault of the, uh, of the older cars, I suppose, that they need that extra time. But it's also a fault of the charging infrastructure. There's not more chargers, you know, if you got to an old petrol station and um, there was a, I don't know, a car which they absolutely had to brim to the very top to be able to get to the distance between, you know, to the next um, yeah. petrol station. And it kept clicking off and clicking off, but they kept filling it and filling it and filling it. I suppose you, you might get slightly annoyed after a few minutes, but it, it would only be a few minutes. It would only be, you know, four or five minutes, you know, max from, from empty to completely full. I think the issue is when we've obviously got the longer charge times on the electric cars and when there's, you know, 
there isn't the 12 other pumps to go to like there is at a petrol station that, that you think that uh you know somehow people think they've got more right to use a charger than other people or that people ought to disconnect because they need a charge more than they do um it's uh what did annoy me last last week was in ikea in warranty there's four charges there are three consistencies uh, and there's four that are in a block they're not in a line they're in a block and um there was a, a brand new Audi e-tron uh, on one of the charges, wasn't even plugged in, and he'd been sat there. And there was a guy waiting when I got there, and I pulled up, I couldn't get on charge. It was all, there was two Reynolds always on, and there was a, an H, um, a Mitsubishi PHAV EV on. Yeah. And this e-tron was sat there. And when I got up the car, passed up a little bit further down, walking back, and this guy said to me, are you looking for a charging space? So I said, I was. I said, well, it's full, isn't it? So he said, this fella here with this heat on, he's been here now four and a half hours, he's not even plugged in. Just That's sat the problem, the problem with IKEA as a charging destination in that people go into that store and they don't come out for hours and hours and hours. That's right, that's right. That's exactly what happened. And it's, so it's, 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 it's the wrong sort of charge though, really, because they should have put in type twos, they should have put in a bank of 20, you know, for the cost of those rapid chargers, that's like 25, 30 grand a pop. Each rapid charger could be replaced by 10 type two chargers at seven kilowatts. Yep. So they could charge 40 cars rather than four. Yeah. Over the course of the, you know, let's say, you know, three hours of average. Four hours time, yeah, because you had in the hotel four hours when you go in, there's no getting out through one way and that's it. <laughs> well, that's it, yeah. And, and yeah, on a busy weekend, you just can't even go across the floor. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Five mile queue at the checkout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so but it doesn't make sense really for that to be a, a rapid charge location it doesn't no, I agree. I agree. in the same way it doesn't make sense for uh, mcdonald's to put in um pod point slow chargers which is what they've done in, in burnley so in burnley they've got seven kilowatt uh, chargers at, at mcdonald's you think well surely that is the definition of fast food is something that you want to go in and go out quickly you're not going to leave your car there for six hours to charge up so it's just lack of thought, I think, with these companies, a lot of the time, companies like, well, IKEA only has rapid charges because at the time when Ecotricity was starting the rapid charger network, um, Dale Vince went to all these companies and said, look, I want to put rapid charges around the UK. Um, can I put them in your business? And not many people would sign up for it, apart from IKEA, who said, yeah, go on, we, you know, we, we'll put them in ours. Um, it used to be free at one time in IKEA. I don't, they're not that. It was, yeah, it was free uh, for all Ecotricity originally, and then it was brought in a charge, and then was, uh, IKEA was sub, uh, subsidising it. So if you had a, a fee from uh, Ecotricity, you showed them your email receipt, and then they would um, give you a refund of that amount off what you bought in store. I suppose yep. fair enough. But I say it, it's, it's really it's the wrong sort of location um, for that sort of infrastructure. I think that. As we move forward, things like that grid serve uh, location at Rugby and obviously the one down at Braintree in Essex, um, those sort of hubs uh, with you know some services on site have become more commonplace. Um, Les, near Wigan, obviously, if you've been to the um, MFG site on the um, Crow Orchard Road, Junction 27 of the M6, have you seen that, yeah, Les? Yeah, 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 the altar, yeah. it's called, isn't it? Yeah, so the... Um, MFG group um, that have put those in, they're um, they're putting four courts all around. Yeah, the... that'll work for me. That's quite cool to me. Yeah. yeah. So they're they're looking at um, putting those sort of four courts all around because they've got I think they've got some like two and a half thousand petrol four courts. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to the um, managing director who was actually at um, the services when I was charging uh, one of our electric uh, courses uh, there, and we're doing a video for the for our YouTube. And um, so he was chatting to me about, you know, how easy it was to use the app and, you know, or to use the content list and things like that. And so he was quite interested to know where his money that he was investing was going. So I think they said they spent like one and a half million pounds putting in those charges at Crow Orchard because the cost of the units, but also they had to upgrade the electricity supply to the site and, and all that sort of thing. So um, there are some very big investments going on by these companies, but he said his view initially was we're going to put in lots of these sites and then as years go by, we're going to remove some petrol pumps and put charges where the petrol pumps are. And, you know, so eventually they'll all be charging all over, you know, just replace the petrol pumps with the chargers. Um, 
I did get a bit of a shot while it was the first time I ever used a rapid charger. Uh, was at Tesco in William. Uh, the six pod point charges, there were four of them which are seven kilowatts. Oh, sorry, two of which are seven kilowatts, two of 22 kilowatts, and then there's a shadow ball and a CCS 50 kilowatts uh, on the same site. And I looked at the thing and it said 27 pence a kilowatt. I thought, well, I thought, well, I'll give it a go. I've never used one. I'll give it a try. So what happened? So I did what it said to do on the screen, on the pump itself, and uh, put my card in and let it run for five, four or five minutes. That's all. Just make sure that it was working and everything was all right with the car. And um, so, right, like, that seemed to be fine. It's going up. That's all right. It's working fine. So I went back to the thing, touched the thing again with my car, with my card. Um, and nothing seemed to happen so i touched it again and then it seemed to stop so i plugged it out drove away thought okay that's fine then when i got home i think it was the following day i went onto a bank account looking at something and i had a 60 pound charge um was so the this, holding them out like the mm, 30 pound each time you touched the card it took me 10 days to get it back from four point uh after they explained what had happened and they looked into it and they said yeah what you've done you, you touched the charge to charge and then you touched the stop and then you touched it again so it started charging again so it's charging twice 30 pounds each time plus anyway the good thing about it was the four and a half kilowatts or five kilowatts i put in actually put in they didn't charge me for that <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so that worked out quite well i got the, I got the uh, 230 pound payment back in the end so I haven't never used one before, I just thought I'd try it. So it's like, you know. Well, I had a bit of an interesting one at the weekend, guys. I um, I think I told you last week, or I put it on uh, a thread that um, uh, volunteered to help out Swarco. Swarco had taken over Charge Place Scotland. Mm -hmm. And um, they were asking for volunteers just to do audits on some of the charge points. Yeah. which I was glad to do. I've done a few around about Inverness, but they had nobody to do the north coast, right up from Thurso, right along to the very west in Durness. And uh, I jumped in the car on Sunday, went way up to Thurso, about 100 odd miles, then worked my way along and then came back down. Now, the worrying thing, great at first, but worrying thing was four chargers in a row weren't giving me a rapid charge. And given that it's on the North Coast 500, that's about 90, I worked out about 96 miles of that isn't adequately covered. And you can understand if Charge Play Scotland are, are, are being, the, the current operators are, are moving out and somebody else is moving in, I don't suppose there's a huge imperative to do the repairs that should be done, but I thought it was really quite worrying. And I, I was speaking to, I was getting a cup of coffee at one of the cafes beside one of the chargers at Melvick, right up the, 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 the north coast. Beautiful run, by the way. And the girl in the cafe said, oh, we had a guy charging up today. And he said, this is a nightmare. I can't get anywhere because there's not enough chargers working. So it's right what you say, guys. You know, it's great. I think my car's fantastic. It's great as long as there is the infrastructure there to support yeah, you. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I've done that one a couple of times um, in a diesel, I must admit. Um, but uh, it is a lovely drive, it's a beautiful drive, but the okay. infrastructure is not clever. Swarco, believe it, I, I couldn't believe this, but um, in Wigan, we have um, a company, at, it's, it's in Greater Manchester, I think, called BEEV, and it's run by Swarco, I think, because I've actually seen their vans there uh, repairing one of the charges, a Swarco van, I think, there. and uh, we've got. A few of these BE EV charges, um, 50 kilowatts uh, around Wigan. There's two, I think, in Wigan, and there's a few others around Manchester, uh, around the Manchester district, I should say. Um, and it's uh, on free bank. Yeah, so, so I, I, I'm involved with the Greater Manchester um, EV forum um, that they have with the, uh, with the council and everything. And um, be, uh, GMEV is the, what the electric car network used to be called in Manchester and uh, it was originally run by a company called Charge Your Car and they put yeah. a whole lot of charges in about six seven years ago but Charge Your Car basically went bust uh, or were not having great financial times at least and um, Swarco has bought out the network so the G uh, Greater Manchester um, Council bought uh, got invited tenders from other companies to come in and replace the kit basically and run it themselves and Swarco won it and, the, and they renamed it BEV, that's right. the, the worker bees isn't it for Manchester 
Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, it's on the same Swarco. And Swarco puts in the hardware for MFG Group for their new thing on Crow Orchard Road as well. Um, and Swarco are taking over Scotland, aren't they? So I think they're certainly one of the major players in terms of... Uh, in terms of a lot of infrastructure. So yeah, the, the good thing is that the apps that you use for MFG will work on BEV and will work in Scotland and everything as well. Oh, will it? Using consoles really? as well. So yeah. That's good, I did get a card. Yeah, it's good, but I mean, you can do it without the card, but it's easier with the card. Um, it's not much messing around, it's straightforward with the card. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very good. Yeah, that's true. It's true in, in winging the down wall anyway. Definitely 50 kilowatts of TS. I'm yes. going to move it at the chat because I don't have my wingman here, um, but I see he's adding to chat. But there's quite a few folks saying that they're having a look now, they're getting the first electricity builds in, and they're absolutely delighted that A, the usage has been reduced, and B, just how e efficient the, their uh, EV is, which is great to hear. Um, one, one comment, uh, uh, I think it's from Carol Taylor, asking if we're trying to achieve accents from every part of the country, which obviously is incorrect because I don't have an accent. Um, but uh, some no, good chat. Have I missed anything, Stuart? So I said you're not even in our country, though, are you? <laughs> currently they are, currently. <laughs> and again. Ooh. Anyway. Um, just about, we're only just over the ball. <laughs> can, we, can we talk about squealing brakes? Because there's quite a few comments on the on the chat about um, the five and who's experienced squealing brakes when reversing. I do every single morning. Yeah, I am. What about you, Matt? I, I don't get it because I don't reverse first in the morning. I do get it squealing going forward first in the morning. But oh, okay. I put that down to they're just cleaning the surface oxide off the brakes because I've had that in other vehicles. It's that in the other you normally get a little bit of surface thrust and stuff like that, especially with the current wet climate. Well, I'm the opposite, Matt. I, I reverse all to my drive every morning. It's when I'm in reverse, it just does it just a couple of squeaks and it's gone. Then. Yeah, I just yeah, I don't need it again. I've never I had it. Out a bit of rust. I've never had it in a car ever. So uh, it's a you know, there's a few people that have mentioned it, and also on their ZSs as well on the chat. I've had it on quite a few cars. I've had it on quite a few electric cars, particularly. And I think it's part of the reason is because obviously we don't use the brakes as heavily on an electric car. Yeah. Um, and also, I think you, you notice it more because first thing in the morning when you start the car, it's silent. That's right. In the car, you've got your uh, engine possibly running at a slightly faster idle because it's cold. Yeah. It's a um, and you'd you know rev it slightly as you lift your clutch, and you, it, you wouldn't you know that would mask an awful lot of additional yeah. you're good, exhausting good the, shout that's a car. professional answer that one so, oh, <laughs> turn the music up well no but yeah i just i i i, I drive for, i reverse onto my drive and I, I drive forwards off it so i don't experience a squeal particularly that i've noticed um but uh, i have noticed it, I've had it a few times but not much what yeah, about the, the squealing mirrors that's the way the wind blows i think for me it's a, a part of my Half my car's against my house, so it's getting shielded, and half of it opens the elements. So I suppose it depends which way the wind, the rain's blowing for it to get in, and perhaps put some yeah. extra oxidation on there. And um, does anybody experiencing squealing mirrors when they shut the car down? Well, this uh, could be because the engine's not there and it's so quiet. <laughs> uh, the squealing mirrors is it needs lubrication. It was that was an issue we had on the folding mirrors on the Leaf. Uh, 2018 when that first came out with folding mirrors um mm. it's if you take it into dealership what they'll do is they'd, they'd strip it down and they um put some basically more grease on it and then it, it'll stop it it just needs some i wouldn't use wd-40 because that sort of tends to uh you need something thick you need some like um silicone grease wd-40 not is a degreaser more than an oil anyway so mm. that's the common mistake with wd-40 is it will stop it for a couple of days, but then it will come back and then it's back. Yeah, show you that. Matt, yeah. What are we doing? Then? Cooking fat or what? Yeah, I could use that. <laughs> um, it's, a bit, uh, it's a duck fat, you know, left over from the from the. Uh, it'll all back on. Right? <laughs> um, there's yeah. also we, we just want uh, there was a message from um, Stuart about the roof rails. How Les, what what do you think about? this resolution with the roof rails are you happy with it because i know you've been a bit of a pioneer on the forum haven't you um, 
I, I was happy to have a going away because at the end of the day, um, when I first in the car, it was loaded to 50 kilos. Um, not that I usually roof raise very much at all, but I looked at it uh, uh, lots of ways. I looked at it from a safety aspect. If somebody put 50 kilos on there and they weren't safe and it came off, it's going to create havoc, especially on a motor. I also looked at it on another angle that if in a couple of years' time or two or three years' time I decide to sell the car on and buy a different one or buy another MG, it may make no difference what it is. And somebody comes along and I, this is what MG said originally, that I've got, I have got to tell them that you cannot use the roof rate. And that, for me, was absolutely ludicrous. The fact that I, as the owner, have to inform the new owner who's coming to buy the car, you can't use them roof rates. Well, if he wants to buy them rates for a couple of bikes on or a surfboard or something, he ain't going to buy the car, is he? He's just going to walk away from me. He's going to go buy a, a Focus or an Astra or whatever else that is available. Um, so that was the annoying part about it for me. But he came up with some sort of resolution several months ago, um, which they said, right, okay, you could do 35. I think it was the 15th of January, something like that. You could put 35 on, and then the same day, they withdrew it again. So I was very dubious then. I thought, someone not right here. I still haven't got the car at that time. And then a few weeks back, they came up with this, the DBSA uh, emailed me and said they'd, they'd spoke to MG and they'd got it up to 35 kilos and there was going to be uh, a handboot change and every owner was going to be off. Well, of course, the poll went ballistic with people buying roof rails and searching Aldi out, searching Little out, so searching everywhere else out for these crossbars. Uh, and I said to them at the time, I said, just take it easy, let's get it in writing first. Let's get this right because if something did happen and it's not right, I'm only going off what I've been told by email. If something did happen and it's not right, somebody could have an insurance problem. And I was very dubious about that. So, but now, if it's right and it's 35 kilos, as Marley just said tonight, he's got confirmation on it. Uh, they have said to me today on email that um, they are looking at a recall. They've not explained what the recall is about. I have asked that question. Miles is just explaining it's to do something with the handbook and perhaps check something. I don't know. But then we've got to live with what it is. It's as simple as that. And people will get to know that it only takes so much weight, and that's the end of it. But I mean, I don't particularly use them that much. Very occasionally I've used them. Very, very occasionally. And that's just been, if we, for example, in the winter time, we've had a fence panel blows or something like that. I'd have had to go to BQ buy a new fence panel. You know, a, a 65 fence panel and just stick it on the roof, and fence it over the store. There's never a problem. Like it all wants to get in the back. Yeah. At least, we don't get that, at least we won't have that problem of, of having the sunlight blocked on our panoramic roofs either, will we? Because we don't have them. <laughs> we don't have them. We don't have to worry about it, do we? <laughs> the thing is, it, it was a thing that needed it was a thing that needed to be addressed. And then as soon as I seen it, I, I ordered the car on the 3rd of November. And on the 5th of November, I was lying in bed reading an online version of a PDF version of the handbook. And I got to page 67 and it was through. Under the fact, in the same chapters, it tells you how to use the lights and the wipers and God knows what else, instruments and controls. I couldn't believe my eyes. I could not believe what I was reading. But yet, page 180 of what it tells you about loading the car, it doesn't mention anything at all about the roof rate. Not a mention anywhere, which was absolute madness. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. And then the other thing on top of all that was I got in touch with a guy in China, and you've probably seen it on the phone. I managed to get in touch with a guy in China, and he looked into it, and apparently the handbook in Chinese says exactly the same wording on page 62. Roof rails are decorative only. It cannot be used. But that really annoyed me because MV had no rights to advertise that car as being able to carry 50 kilos, and especially putting photographs on the website. With yeah, the, the story behind that from MG's point of view in the UK was that um, they understood that the roof rails were rated to the same capacity as the uh, ZSEV mm -hmm. uh, kilos. And when they went to do all of their accessories and photo shoots and everything, they wanted to make a big deal, obviously, of it being a, a load carrying car, it's an estate car, yeah. Often, yeah, a state car yeah. bikes and things like that, you know. And um, they took all of the uh, promotional photos and everything. And then it was so basically the sales. The sales team at MG weren't talking to the, to the engineers um, and or, or weren't speaking, forgive it because it's perhaps the English to Chinese, but they weren't speaking the same language. 
and um, the um, uh, so the sales team were all you know going great guns with their accessories and everything else, and you know getting the brochures printed up and all of the marketing materials and so on. And and then yes, it came as a bit of a surprise to them, I think, when uh, when the, you know they got the thing for the, from the engineering saying, oh yeah, by the way, they're they're not rated or they're not been tested at least. Um, and therefore we can't give a rating. So um, it's, well, well, but it's taken time to sort it, but it's, I think that's the, um, the thing is it is now sorted. Uh, thank God um, we've now got a resolution. I say in terms of the uh, recall, all they're doing is it's coming in, they're sticking a page over page 62 or whatever it is that says yeah. it can carry 35 yeah. kilos, this includes yeah. this and this. Um, and that's... Uh, so that's where we're at with it. It looks like they're sol solving it for the facelift MG5. There's still no news of that coming to the UK yet. No, I know that, but they've, sat, they've already said on that one it can take 75 kilos, haven't they? It can take 75 kilos, yes. Yeah, so that's got some proper bars on it. So mm -hmm. but that's more like you get on the Audi event where it's like stainless mm -hmm. steel. And it can solve as well. You, you heard it here first. You heard it here first. Les's uh, forum name for us from next week is the Ro Roof Rail Warrior. I've yeah. already had that given to me some <laughs> while ago, indeed. Uh, a chap called Richie down in Essex, um, he gave me, he christened me with that one. I said, hang on a minute, you're going a bit far with that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm think... not being funny. It, it, it was annoying. And the thing is, I spent from November the 6th to Christmas in constant email contact with MG, uh, head office, and it was coming back with absolutely nothing. I spoke to numerous people on the phone, and was promised a response, got nothing. And in the end, it got to that stage whereby I did eventually get a letter back telling me that that is how it is and that's how it's staying. And we ain't doing nothing about it. And you will be responsible for telling the next owner you cannot use the roof here. Well, that was it then. That was blew me then. So I then thought, what am I going to do here? I wasn't too sure who to contact, who not to contact. But I was a member of which magazine, so I asked them the question of who, who I should speak to. And they said, oh, hang on a minute, what's going on? So I explained the story to them. And they obviously put it out in the press and God knows what else. Now the newspapers and all sorts of things, now I'm getting involved in all that. Um, but then it was explained to me that I should go to the uh, DVSA and let them look at it, which I did in the end. And uh, spent, I spent quite a lot of time on it, to be quite honest. Quite a lot of time on it. I think um, about it. we've got a result anyway. We've got something. It's not the, brilliant, but it, it is what it is. With um, on behalf of all the MG5 drivers, you know, we all tip our hats to you, and thank you very much for doing thank that. You. Because, you know, it's, it's appreciated because it does take time, and you know, it may be if you hadn't have dug your heels in or got a hold of that bone, it may never have happened. So, and it is one of those things. Well, there may well have been a serious accident on the road. Yeah, for sure. And I also appreciate that hopefully my residuals have gone up a little bit in the last 20, 30 minutes as well, Absolutely. knowing with the good news. So when I come to sell the car, it'll be worth a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. I hope so, yeah. Just I picking mean, up on something... Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, just picking up on something earlier on in the week that uh, we, we saw was Lucky Five was asking what's the main technical difference of how or why the, the motor drive train is different from the ZS to the five. I suppose that's something you could pick up, is it, Miles? Say again, sorry. Somebody, uh, Lucky Five was asking, we'd love to hear a technical description of how or why the motor drive train is different from the ZS to the, 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 the five. Is, is it, or? Yeah, it's different. It's got different gearing, different physical motor, um, obviously different battery pack as well. Yeah. Um, the gearing is quite different in the in the five. So in the ZS EV, um, the, the torque curve, although it's a fairly linear torque, there is still a, a sweet spot with electric motors. And on the ZS EV, its uh, torque curve is set that it works best um, up to about sort of 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour. On the MG5, it's got longer gearing and it's it's actually got an extended torque curve. It tends to be best around the sort of 45 to 75 mile an hour sort of thing, which gives more efficiency, which is part of the reason why we get better range uh, over the ZSEV, particularly on motorway runs. Um, but it's also why we've 115 mile an hour top speed instead of 90 on the 
ZSEV. Um, not that we need to use, you know, those sort of top speeds, but uh, it is. Um, yeah. Has anybody so, done that on the track yet? 115. Yeah, on the track. No, I haven't taken it to 115. No, I, I have seen. I've seen north of a ton. On a, really? on a private section of, of, of road, uh, Gosh, uh, yes. on a private test track, yeah. I've seen over 100 miles now, but I've not taken it to 115. Have you seen the, the thing where it says, um, the, the, does anybody have the little warning to tell you to slow down? It's like a foot brake in the top of the, the, the display. Have you seen that? On that oh, so you can set that uh, overspeed warning, uh, yes. whatever speed you want it to be. Um, yeah. So if you press on the on the, when you're on the main menu, if you press left, yeah. you get onto a menu where you can choose luminance and one of them's overspeed pressure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can, so you can set that up yourself. But um, I've had it before. Was it the five or was it the ZSEV? One of them on a private section of test track. Um, it did come up saying, um, yeah, power limitation or something like that. Because it, it was, it, when it gets to, the thing is, the motor's doing about 17,000 RPM at its yeah. top speed. So it's fair whizzing round. Um, so uh, yeah, it does. It does warn you perhaps sometimes, particularly if you're on, a, if you were doing a constant power drain. Because using an awful, I, I think I did it once. I can't remember which car it was, the five or the ZS. Basically, to see how the power drops off. Because when you get to that top RPM, well, that top power draw, there's a, a limit of to how how long it can deliver that power for. Be, because the batteries are draining quickly as well, you know, and it's pushing all the heat into the batteries and things like that. So, yeah, um, yeah it does. I think it sort of red lines around sort of, let's say, fifteen thousand RPM, something like that, on the motor. It's on the on the chat, um, I think who was it who said somebody mentioned about? I'm sorry, I can't I can't see your name now. But about one of the things I miss is the speed limiter. I used to on the Merc. I used to have the speed limiter, which is great for if you were sort of just going up and down the motorway um, to set it at um, the, the national speed limit, obviously, or if you're in a 60, because it's quite easy to go over, isn't it, in these cars? I, I did a journey today um, where I didn't need to worry about battery. It was a, a 60 miles there, 60 miles back um, commute, so I had no, no worries about draining the power. And I looked down at my speedo, and it was slightly over um, the 70, and it just doesn't feel like it because there's no drama with the engine, is there? No, no. I had that actually yesterday. Was it yesterday? No, not yesterday. Does the cruise control not do the same thing? Once you've set that to seven seat, it'll say it's seven seat. No, no, because you can still put your foot down. Ah, right. Yeah, you can. Right. With, with, with the Merc, I'd set it to 70. Yeah. And then yeah. as soon as you got to it, it wouldn't go any faster. Well, I've never had that. I don't remember it to so I've no idea. Yeah. I don't understand what you're saying now, yeah. Yeah, so on the ZSEV, you can set a speed limit manually or intelligently using the camera um, instead of the cruise control. Uh, there's no option for that on the MG5, sadly, which no. is um, perhaps again going to be addressed when they, with the new version when they put the MG Pilot on the facelift version. Yeah, but in terms of, um, I mean, I drove the, uh, the MG5 back from Preston the other day and uh, taken it on the M65 and quite easily. You're keeping up with other cars, and you look down, and you go, "Oh, seventy-one. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, or, yeah. Or, yeah. or perhaps you know, sort of maybe 15, 20 miles an hour more than that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't think I need that speed limit this year. I've got somebody sat at the side of me, and they say, "What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Is there not? A, do you not have a mute button for that though?" Yeah, <laughs> I'm <laughs> trying to find it. Keep putting that one on the steering wheel, but don't yeah. stop it. <laughs> on the steering wheel somewhere. <laughs> Last thing to cover off, guys, before we before we go, um, sort of upgrades and changes that we've made to our MG5s. Um, I've had the windows tinted on mine yeah. um, because I feel it's quite a lot of glass in the back, and it does get quite old. And I've got dogs and kids. Um, not too bothered about the kids, but I don't want the dog to get too hot. Right. So um, I've had the windows tinted. The rear tints cost less than £200, I think it was, uh, for the rear tints to be done. They've done a good job on it. Um, I think it sets the car off quite nicely. Uh, the other thing I've got is the protection pack from MG. So yeah. the um, mats and the mud flaps and the boot liner. I've got the rubberized boot liner, yeah. 
worked, seems to work quite well with all the stuff I was taking to the tip. There was quite a few grotty things and it was good to be able to just lift that out and shake it out and it was clean again rather than having it all get in. It's awful when you get stuff into the weave of the carpet. There's nothing, particularly with dogs as well, isn't it? You know, your dog hair just, you can't get it out. That's terrible. We have a husky, an absolute chaos. My son has a husky. And when that gets in the car, especially with the black interior, you can fill a duvet cloak with it. No problem at all. I'll do it every day. It's unbelievable. I, I can't stand why my dog's not bald. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's, uh, genuinely, he molts so much. This I've got a cocker spaniel cross Datsun, um, so he's dafted the brush and uh, too small to do anything about it. So he's, um, but he just molts for fun. He just it, like you, he'll yeah, come and jump on you and like land, you know, sit on your, sit in your lap and you like stroke him twice and you look, literally look in your hand like a snowball of fur. And he's like, how how is this okay? I've just brushed him before, you know. It's like my son takes his husky in the backyard and starts pushing it. And the birds line up on the fence to pick the earl up to a test week. <laughs> yeah, we get that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was lots of dogs, I suppose. But it's, One thing, uh, can, can I just mention as well, have you, have you finished on your bit there, Miles? Uh, yeah, yeah, just yeah. Uh, the other thing, I try, as I tried the uh, ZS wheels on the <laughs> M5. What? One uh, thing I'm really impressed with, I know we're pushed for time a bit, but I just wanted to mention as well, I had a problem, um, I'm not going to go into it, but it was a charging problem with the charger um, that I mentioned a few weeks ago, but I was really impressed with the level of cover. I was not expecting the AA cover to cover yeah, what I had. I already saw it, yeah. And, and when, you know, when I'd broken down, when, it, when the car wouldn't start, I was thinking that I would have the minimum cover Mm -hmm. Just because I hadn't looked into it and wasn't mm -hmm. expecting the car to break down. Oh, it's full floor. Full floor. But to go through the whole recovery process and you know get a loan car, which was kind of okay, it went from A to B. Um, and I was relieved to get rid of it, but I was not expecting that with MG. So I think that's a good selling point as well. I don't I, I just didn't know that was that would be the case. The good and thing about that as well, Stuart, is the fact that when you've had it serviced, it upgrades it for another well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's never ending as long as you carry on getting it serviced. Yeah, as long as you keep having it serviced by an MG um, dealer, yeah, uh, it's fine. It's no problem. It's good. Uh, one thing I did, I did discover on the same subject, if you don't mind, is that uh, I'm insured with LV Insurance, and they have their own battery recovery system. If you run out of battery, they will recover you as well. So I've got two, if you like it. I've got the AA from MG, and I've got the uh, one from LV. If, if, if I did run out of battery, I have no intention of doing so, but if I did, I've got a bit of backup. So mm -hmm. that is good in that respect. It's, I've never heard of anybody doing that before, but when I when I rang up to change my car over from the Superb to the MG5, she told me, you've got this battery covered. I said, what are you talking about? She said, if you happen to run out of charge anywhere, she said, uh, just give me the ring and we've got bands that come out with built-in um, superchargers up that they can just plug in and charge you up in no time at all. Or oh, they'll take it to the nearest supercharger, to a rapid charger, I should say. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's all sorts of things going on. Getting better and better, there's no danger about that. I'll you just can... say one point, if you don't mind, just say the subject a minute, uh, maybe if you don't mind. Um, when I got my car home, when my car was delivered, uh, which was the back end of March, uh, right to the back end of March, I think it was the 30th of March, actually. Um, when it was delivered, um, my neighbour up the road, who was a similar age to me, I'm 75, he was a similar age to me. He came down to have a look at it, and uh, I took him like a run around the block in it, and he was over the moon. Five days later, he'd bought one from Charlie MG. Yeah. He went up to Charlie and bought one straight away. He said, I'm having one, that's it. And he bought the red one, I've got the blue one. <coughs> it's got the same car. But one difference I did notice, and you may, you may have seen, you know, you know about this, I know you do. Uh, on the floor of them, there was a bit of a thing about rust. Um, uh, on the ZS in particular, I think it started off with, and then there was on about the MG5. What was that like? It's underneath and whatever. Yeah. Anyway, I did. Mine was only a week old, and I took it up to my local garage where I've always been from the servicing, and he put it up on the ramp for me, and we had a good look round. And the under ceiling on it left a bit to be desired. I must admit, it did. Um, it's been rectified now, but it did leave a bit to be desired. Um, but the thing is. Mine around the suspension struts on the back and on the front, uh, there was like a, a six or seven inch swirl where there was no sealant of any description whatsoever, where the, the uh, shock exhaust was bolted to, and underneath at the back where the spring seats are, where the actual coil spring sits into, 
It was just basically just almost prime metal. That's all. It was just prime, burnt primer. There was nothing there. And we really was quite shocked. I did do a video about it, but I couldn't upload it. Just couldn't upload it. I don't know what it was about. Um, but anyway, um, the annoying part about it was when my friend at the rodeo got his MG from MG, Charlie MG, I went down, I mentioned it to him, and he said, yeah, he said, I've heard about this. He said, well, let's have a look at yours. And, like, and his was practically all covered. The whole of his was covered, and mine wasn't. I was, well, it's not her, it's not right, this. Well, that's how it would be, obviously. I said, mine must have been made on a Friday when they were going home with a different point. Simple as that. Didn't do mine properly. Well, I've yeah. said it before. I'm, I'm getting my Marvel R from the Charlie group, so. I'll say, you say, you get it from us, but it's sorted, you see, that's it. <laughs> we just, we just, we just. I'll throw that in mind. I knew nothing about you until I got the car. <laughs> okay, guys, we're to our customers. We're going to have to sort of start winding this up. Uh, Stuart, is there anything else I've missed on the? Elias, a couple of folks have said thank you for doing that in the roof rails. So it's great to see you yeah. getting knowledge for that. I did, I did notice we've well, got. I've got me a line. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We've got um some uh, chap called Richard Heesman. He's actually. He's actually getting a new five in the second week of June, it looks like, who currently has a S500 Mercedes. So that's another jumping ship from a Mercedes to the premium brand that is MG. <laughs> no more to say. Is he working for the Charlie Cruiser? Well? An S500, you could probably buy two MG5. <laughs> S500s aren't as expensive as you think. I used no, to S twenty, depends. and uh, it sold for five hundred quid. Yeah, oh. uh, it's no, no, not It's the liability, um, isn't it? Um, it's that it's an old car. The old Mercedes are not expensive to buy. They look good, but they are expensive for fueling and stuff like that. Parts I didn't find too bad, but it served a purpose. Um, as long as you do the research on any used car. Oh, yeah, that, that research is for another day. I didn't do any of that before I got my own. Um, I, I always do research when I'm yeah. spending money. I just jump straight into it. But I'm done anyway. So, yeah. Okay, guys. Well, it's been great to have you all contributing. It's been great to see two new faces on the podcast yeah. week, this week. So thank you, Les, and thank you, Matt. But again, we said it last week. If there's any other MGEV owners out there who'd like to join the podcast, including the HS, um, please, please just hit the open invitation thread on the podcast and we'll follow that up. Another please, please is remember to look at the merchandise. We've added quite a few new options in the last few weeks, so there's something there for everybody. Uh, please check it out. Uh, uh, and uh, there's a link in the forum menu to take you straight to the, the merchandise. And again, just to mention to all the MGEV drivers of Scotland, there's a bunch of us meeting up on Sunday, the 11th of July at one o'clock. And it'd be very remiss of me if I didn't finally mention the premium membership for just three pounds a month. And that gives you the premier membership badge, the ability to upload a profile banner, the ability to select the MG Red theme, updated to show all the, the three M MGs uh, EVs, and there's the discount uh, code as well, a full 10% when you use the, the code. So thanks very much for everybody that's joined us today. Uh, Matt, thank you very much for coming on board. All right. Uh, Les, thank you for your contribution and thanks for all the work you've been doing on the roof rails. Thank you, thank you. I was just wondering if one of the additions that you can actually build, you could maybe get a, a, a wind turbine and clip it onto your roof rails. I wish. <laughs> you could charge up as you go along, but somebody's going to correct me about the laws of physics or something. <laughs> Stuart, Stuart, it's great to see you again this week. Nice to see you all. Um, and again, a special thanks to, to Miles Roberts from the Charlie Group. Thank you, Miles, for all your input. No, thank you, guys. It's always good to be on here. Great. And as usual, uh, doing all our graphics uh, and thanks for watching pops up, as I say, Stuart Wright in the, the background working feverishly. Now, can I just say, Dave, can I just say thank you to Stuart Wright for talking me through this this morning to get it going. Well, thank you, Stuart. 
I knew if I stayed on the podcast long enough, I'd find out that you did something. That's good. That's helpful. Um, next Monday is actually a bank holiday, so we'll not be here, but we will be back on Monday, the 7th of June, at the usual time of 7.30. Thanks for everybody to tuning in. Thanks for your Zoom chat. And thanks, everybody, for participating tonight. It's been great. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.